on this Sunday night. The driver was screaming. The bus just crashed. Like the, the next second, I just went flying. New details tonight about the final moments before the deadly Ottawa bus crash and the life-altering injuries some passengers are now dealing with. There's no one else to pay. I mean, ultimately, it's the people taking these medications who are paying. Pharmacists caught on camera negotiating kickbacks and patients are paying the price. Reaction to our fifth estate investigation. They haven't felt this much camaraderie and seen this many people in the lunchroom um, since 9-11. The gratitude is just overwhelming. A special arrival for American air traffic controllers caught up in the government shutdown. The cross-border act of kindness is our moment of the day. This is The National. Tomorrow will be a difficult day here in Ottawa. The first time passengers will be commuting along that same transit way where a bus went careening off the road and slammed into a shelter. Three people were killed, nearly two dozen injured. And as the CBC's Robin Miller tells us, for many who survived, it will be a long road to recovery. They are haunting images of an everyday bus ride that ended in horror. Twisted metal and broken glass, just a fraction of the damage done. There's a lot of glass on the floor from like breaking the windshield and the bus stop. And then I saw someone lying in front of the bus, like on top of a pool of blood. I also see another uh, woman, I think she fell off from the second floor, and then there's like blood dripping from her head and she's talking. In total, 23 people were treated and those still in hospital are now listed in serious or stable condition. As ambulances raced out, hospital staff mobilized to save lives and extra equipment was brought in to help with the many amputations. People are rallying behind a woman who lost a leg and is in a medically induced coma. Police have not released the names of those killed, but members of the Canadian Armed Forces were among the injured. Late tonight, the transitway reopened. Investigators have left the scene and the bus shelter has been repaired. But for people who survived the crash, the emotional damage will linger. Chad Mariage knows all about that. He was on another double-decker bus in 2013 when it collided with a Via Rail train. Six people were killed. He says it's important survivors talk about the experience. I would you know, highly recommend that the, they kind of do the same and talk talk about it is, is key, not to keep all that stuff bottled in because uh, I think that, uh, that kind of exacerbates the problem in my view. The city's medical officer of health says events like this impact the entire community. Certainly people who ride the bus, you know, people who, who could imagine uh, that was them, it, it can, can cause concern. Uh, people can have emotions such as uh, anxiety or fear. And so uh, it's important for people to know that's normal and also that there are res resources to help them. Those resources include city staff who will be available to help riders along the transitway tomorrow. Two memorials have also been set up for those wishing to honour the victims and a book of condolence is set up at City Hall. Robin Miller, CBC News, Ottawa. Ottawa police are leading the investigation. It's still not clear what caused the crash and they warn that results won't come swiftly. This will be a long and detailed and complex investigation. We are reviewing all aspects of the collision, including the vehicle, the roadway, weather and the driver's actions. Yesterday, officials drove a double-decker bus along that same route to try and get a feel for the conditions. Drones were also used to give an aerial perspective. An estimated 90 passengers were on the bus at the time, so officials hope to interview all those survivors. The bus itself records data, which police will review. Transport Canada and Ontario's Ministry of Transportation are also investigating. The night of the crash, the bus driver was taken to police headquarters, questioned and then released. The police chief warned the public not to read anything into the fact that she was arrested. Generic drugs cost a lot more in Canada than in most comparable countries. Your prescription may be overpriced by as much as 70 percent. Well, tonight, Mark Kelly, co-host of CBC's The Fifth Estate, investigates why. And we begin with his hidden camera video of pharmacists discussing kickbacks that would be illegal. You may have seen it earlier tonight on The Fifth Estate. But now Mark pushes the story further, looking for accountability. 
17 pharmacies in three days. We took our hidden cameras to see if pharmacy owners would ask for illegal kickbacks to sell generic drugs from our fictitious drug manufacturing company. And they did, time and time again. When was the deal on it? Uh, the deal on the, well, the rebate. What's the comfortable number for you? 70. 70? Okay. The kickbacks are known as rebates in the pharmaceutical industry. Drug manufacturers pay them to pharmacists and pharmacy chains, anywhere from 40 to 70 percent of the cost of the drugs to ensure pharmacies will stock their product. And this is just a small sample, but a typical sample of what we came across. We showed our hidden camera footage to Dr. Danielle Martin, an advocate pushing to reform Canada's pharmaceutical drug pricing policies. We know from the economic analyses, from the research, from the evidence on this, that in Canada we pay so much more for generic drugs than other comparable countries do. And so what happens when you're overpaying is uh, people are going to engage in rent-seeking behaviours. They're going to try to get a piece of that profit, a piece of that action, and that's what, that's what we're seeing in action right here in these, in these videos that you've got. The Competition Bureau of Canada released a report which said eliminating rebates and other pricing reforms could save the health care system as much as $800 million a year. Toronto doctor Nav Persaud was shocked by what we showed him. He says he deals with patients every day who can't afford the cost of their prescription drugs. And he says rebates are a big reason why. If these companies can offer kickbacks or rebates of 70%, it means that the medications are overpriced by 70%. And the consumer is the one paying the tab for this. There's no one else to pay. I mean, ultimately, it's the people taking these medications who are paying either directly out of pocket, through taxes, or through insurance premiums. Ontario was the only province to ban rebates. When the ban was introduced in 2010, pharmacists fought it. So did the then opposition health care critic, Christine Elliott. The McGinty Liberals are vilifying pharmacists, but most... Elliott is now Ontario's health minister. We asked her office what the minister planned to do about these pharmacists asking for illegal kickbacks and the drug companies who are paying them. In a statement, the minister wouldn't comment on the findings of our investigation or even commit to look into what we found, only saying suspicious activity should be reported. In the meantime, kickbacks will continue to be paid across Canada and Canadians will continue to pay some of the highest generic drug prices in the world. Mark Kelly, CBC News, Toronto. And if you'd like to watch Mark's entire Fifth Estate investigation, you can stream it anytime on CBC Gem. Just download the app or head to cbc.ca slash fifth. Plenty of speculation in this town about how Prime Minister Justin Trudeau will reshape his cabinet tomorrow following the resignation of longtime Liberal Scott Bryson. The shuffle is expected to be small and CBC has learned who will fill the job as Treasury Board President. David Cochran is breaking that for us tonight. Okay, David, tell us what you've learned so far. Yeah, Rosie, uh, finding Scott Bryson's replacement in Treasury Board was really job number one in this shuffle, and CBC News has learned that the Prime Minister has asked Jane Philpott to take on that role. Philpott, of course, is currently the Minister for Indigenous Services. She's a former Minister of Health and widely seen as one of the most effective members of the federal cabinet. And what senior government officials have been saying all along is that finding a key person for Treasury Board is really the focus of this shuffle. That department manages the nuts and bolts of government. It gets money and projects and programs out the door, and with an election nine months from now. The Liberals are keen to have someone in that role that can deliver on their ongoing promises and the promises in the upcoming budget, which of course will be their last budget before the election. So that's why a key senior minister like Philpott is going there and Rosie, she'll be just the third woman to ever hold that job. Okay, so that, that makes some sense. Uh, we, we know she's moving. What have you learned about who will replace her and then, of course, the dominoes that fall because of those changes? Yeah, she's a big domino. Moving her out of Indigenous services was a key part of the government's reconciliation agenda. So another experienced minister is going in there. And what Liberal sources are telling me tonight is that Veterans Affairs Minister Seamus O'Regan is going to move into that role, which creates another opening. And we're not quite sure who's going to fill that one because <laughs> this is not a shuffle the Prime Minister was planning to do, right? Sure. This was all caused by Scott 
Bryson, who told him before Christmas he was getting ready to retire. The Prime Minister asked him to take Christmas to think about it. But when Bryson came back, I said, no, I'm sticking with this decision. The conversation started last weekend and throughout this week. So it's a small shuffle. We're told four, five, at most six ministers will be affected. Philpott and O'Regan are the two we know. We also know someone from Nova Scotia is going to get a promotion to replace Bryson. We're not sure who it is, but the smart betting seems to be on two MPs, Sean Frazier, who represents right. Central Nova, and Bernadette Jordan from the south shore of that province. Okay, and we'll get all this firmed up at 845 tomorrow when the Cabinet Shuffle actually happens. Thanks for all that great reporting, David. Appreciate it. You're welcome. In a matter of days, Rahaf al Kanun's life has completely changed, from a Saudi teenager on the run to a refugee finding her bearings in Canada. Now, what saved her from being tracked down and sent back to Saudi Arabia was a loud cry for help on social media. But now she's keeping a lower profile, settling into her new home. So what's next? Susan Ormiston answers that question. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Here it is, here it is, here it is. Rahaf al kunun is now a government-assisted refugee. And like others, she'll get a year of support and assistance from a settlement agency. But the notoriety which helped win her freedom also sets her apart. She is in a shelter with security, but still somewhat anxious about her safety, according to Yasmin Mohammed, who's been texting with her. I think that with the onslaught of death threats coming at her from social media, from family members in some cases, it's, that's what's causing her the, the most anxiety. She's safe in Canada. She's going to be okay. Al Kunun has described being beaten at home. Locked in her house, she called herself an atheist, risking punishment in Saudi Arabia. I'm not leaving my room until I see UNHCR. Detained at the Thai airport, she feared she would be killed if forced back. The UNHCR declared her at risk, and Canada accepted that. And Canada was glad that we were able to act quickly and to offer refuge to a refugee at the request of UNHCR and to offer refuge to a person whose life was in danger. So far, no official response from Saudi, but her very public exit will reverberate. The honour of the family is with the girls. So when a young girl in the family defies her family in this way, it's embarrassing for all the men in the family, they're going to be hearing such things as, oh, you can't even control your own women. Canada's former ambassador to Saudi says there will likely be pushback inside the country. There will probably be some families that are saying, that are tightening the controls on their daughters at the moment, concerned that this is an example that they don't want them to follow. But the relative silence from the kingdom may mean, he says, that guardianship laws ceding men control over women are under pressure. I'm a bit surprised as well that they haven't made more of a fuss about it. And, and the way I read it, though, is that they, they want this to sort of start to disappear because of the, the global uh, light it's shown. Al Kunin's story is inspiring others and unleashing more tweets this weekend from people asking for help from Yemen, Afghanistan and Saudi Arabia. A GoFundMe campaign has started in Canada. No. Uh, Mary O'Kali of Costi Resettlement Services calls Al Kanun determined. I said, this in many respects is the first day of the rest of your life, so there's a lot of decisions you need to make. And she was totally fine. She, she said, yes, it is. And, and she was uh, very well composed about it all. Composed, maybe, but unprepared for winter. So today, she found a puffy jacket and a toque. Very Canadian. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Toronto. But indeed, uh, Rosie, as Susan mentioned, I mean, the Saudi response to this, or lack thereof, has mm -hmm. been surprising. Yeah, it sure has been, Andrew, in part because the last time Canada took a stand on Saudi citizens' human rights, the reaction in that case was as swift as it was severe. Last August, Canada's foreign affairs minister sent just one tweet, demanding the release of two imprisoned women's rights activists. Almost immediately, Saudi Arabia froze trade and investment, yanked funding for Saudis studying in Canadian universities, and barred Canada's ambassador from returning. It's been tense ever since. Talk to us about human rights anytime you want, but lecturing us? No way. We don't take kindly to being, um, you know, to having people try to, uh, try to punish us for believing what we say in, and we'll be firm. Where do you stand now? 
Lines like that might get applause. So might this public embrace of a refugee of Saudi repression. Dennis Horak, the Canadian ambassador who lost his posting during that last diplomatic dust-up, would prefer a quieter approach. In a perfect world, that's, that's, I, that's what I would have recommended. But I understand that there are politics, and, and politics, as I said, politics need to be served, and, and, and politicians like photo ops, and I get that. But I think now that's, that's done. Unlike last August, the global outcry over Saudi Arabia's apparent murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi might have given Canada some diplomatic breathing room. They were beaten down pretty good uh, internationally uh, by the Khashoggi affair, and they, they probably don't want to sort of start this up again. We did the right thing here, but, um, but we need, I think, to be conscious of, okay, where do we go from here? That's something both Ottawa and Riyadh will have to map out, or relations could get worse. The U.S. Secretary of State is in Saudi Arabia, part of a swing through the region. He said earlier today that he will raise the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. We will continue to have a conversation with uh, the Crown Prince and the Saudis about ensuring uh, that the accountability is full and complete with respect to the uh, unacceptable murder of Jamal Khashoggi. Mike Pompeo has said he's seeking a, quote, credible narrative from Riyadh on what happened to the journalist. Voices in Congress have been urging the U.S. pull back some of its support for Saudi Arabia in the wake of Khashoggi's murder. The U.S. president, meanwhile, has been reluctant to criticize the kingdom. Okay, here are some more stories we are watching tonight, starting with a Canadian whose second trial is getting underway in China. Robert Schellenberg was arrested in 2014. Police said he had more than 200 kilograms of methamphetamine. Prosecutors complained the 15-year sentence from his first trial was too lenient. This time, he could get the death penalty. Schellenberg denies the charges. And a dramatic scene at a charity event in Poland when a longtime mayor was stabbed on stage. He's said to be in very serious condition. He's undergone surgery. As for the suspect, he is in custody and claimed the mayor's former party tortured him while he was in prison. Ahead tonight on The National, Donald Trump says it's the most insulting thing he's ever been asked. So how did he answer a question about his ties to Russia? And why Canadian air traffic controllers are sending pizza south of the border. Plus, we'll have this. Hello, Canada. Coming up on The National, my friend Dave Williams has some insight on my mission on the International Space Station. That's a promo from space, people. That's crazy. First, though, this is a crucial week for the British Prime Minister and really the future of the United Kingdom as Theresa May's Brexit deal goes to a vote. Adrian is going to host the National from the UK, and she's already there and brings us this. Have a look at something. This is the tiny town of Pedigo. Right now, uh, we're in Northern Ireland. It's part of the UK. They use the pound sterling as currency. But have a walk here. The end of the white line is basically an international border because now we're standing in the Republic of Ireland. It's affiliated with the EU. They use the euro for currency. And it seems like a bit of a low key novelty, but the ease with which people go back and forth across this international border has become a nightmare in the Brexit scenario. What happens to the livelihoods of people who rely on this flexibility when the United Kingdom leaves the EU, maybe without a deal at all? I want us to leave the European Union on the 29th of March with a good deal that's on the table. That fight plays out Tuesday in the British Parliament when they vote on whether to accept or reject Theresa May's withdrawal plan. Monday, we'll speak with the Irish people who are caught in this mess. Thomas Daglett will be spending time with the stockpilers. And I'm sitting here thinking, will I be able to get medicines in two months' time? Those who are gathering the food and supplies they think the UK might have a hard time getting access to if it crashes out of the EU. And then, of course, the vote itself on Tuesday. And here's a tip. If anyone tells you that they think they have a good idea of what's going to happen, they're probably making it up. This is democracy at its messiest. The deadline is getting closer and it's getting stranger by the day. So we'll bring you the costs and the chaos of the Brexit deal on The National from London this week.
The thought of a 92-year-old woman bruised and bloodied after an attack is disturbing enough on its own. What makes it even worse is where it happened, in a place where she should have been safe from harm. Go Public's Rosa Marcatelli has her story. The photo is hard to look at. Hanka Fogelman after she was attacked while using what's promoted as a safe city-run transportation service for the disabled and the elderly. As soon as the 92-year-old got in, the driver warned her about the young man sitting next to her. The taxi driver said not to talk to him. He's a little aggressive. He's, he's a little dangerous. Minutes into the drive, the man got violent. He started, you know, like punching and hitting me and I, until I started getting, like, from the punch, the blood started coming out from my nose. Montreal police tell Go Public the man who attacked Fogelman has intellectual disabilities and won't be charged. Her family wants to know why the transportation service, STM, would put a fragile senior next to a passenger who posed a risk. Why was he even in the taxi? Why would the taxi driver have sat my mother next to him and closed the door and started driving? The transportation company tells Go Public it had no reason to believe Fogelman was in danger before the attack. So we asked, why then did that driver issue a warning telling Fogelman not to talk to that stranger beside her? The driver simply wanted to ensure a smooth trip. An STM spokesperson tells Go Public, most of our drivers frequently do this simply as a preventative measure. Well, I was saddened, but I wasn't especially shocked. This advocate for older Canadians says these kinds of public transportation services that exist in most major Canadian cities are often lacking in funding and put costs above safety. It's not about dollars. It's about making sure that people get the care they need and that they're safe while doing it. I'm not still not feeling strong. It's been two months since the attack. Fogelman, who is also a Holocaust survivor, says physically she's on the mend, but she's having a hard time dealing with what she's been through. It's just in my mind. The transportation company tells Go Public it doesn't track the number of violent incidents, but says they are very rare. It told the family the man who attacked Fogelman is now banned from using the service. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Calgary. Now, our Go Public team did contact uh, public transit services in several different municipalities. It seems that there's no blanket policy to screen for potentially aggressive passengers. Some places, including Montreal and Vancouver, require a form to be completed by a healthcare or education professional outlining the nature of a person's disability. Others, like Winnipeg, go further, requiring most applicants to undergo an in person assessment. And remember, our Go Public stories come from you. So if you have a tip for Rosa and the team, you can send an email to gopublic at cbc.ca. Okay, up next on The National, the Sunday interview with retired astronaut Dave Williams. We're going to hear his thoughts on the future of space exploration, how he had a hand in putting David St. Jacques on the ISS, plus insights from orbiting Earth. When we're in space, the greatest single message shared by every astronaut is the importance of taking care of our home planet. People would say, what planet do you want to live on in the solar system? I want to live on the Earth. It's the best planet in the solar system. Ten Canadians have traveled to space, and one of them is way up there right now. And lift off. This past December, David St. Jacques was sent on a mission to the International Space Station. Hello, Canada. He's conducting scientific experiments, testing new technologies, and might even go on a spacewalk from here on Earth. Many of us wonder just what it's like to be in space. Well, who would know better than Dave Williams? He's been up there twice, a proud Canadian, and even still a sort of space ambassador. Huge congratulations to you and the rest of the crew. Just this week, he was at a school in Saskatoon helping students ask questions to David St. Jacques on the space station. Keep up the fantastic work. Thank you, Dave. Thank you for being an inspiration to me when I was a young man and a student. He's also a kind of space gatekeeper. He has a hand in deciding who gets to soar the stars. Hey, Dave. Great to see you again. Nice to see you again. So. I met up with Dave Williams earlier this week at the Ontario Science Centre in Toronto. What was that like, first of all, just having that chance 
to speak with David St. Jean. It was fantastic. I was as excited as, as the kids were. You know, it's really nice when you participate in the selection of an astronaut and watch them go through their career. It's waited 10 years to be able to go into space and then to see David in space thriving. It was just fantastic. Was there something about, about what he said or how he looked that, that struck you in particular? I love the energy that he has on board the space station. His smile is incredible. You could see that right at the moment they opened the hatch and came across on board the International Space station. He got a huge Canadian flag on his uh, uniform and a big smile on his face. You knew it was going to be a great mission. You did two missions in space, one in 07, the other in, in 98. Yes. Right? You were part of the selection committee, you know, before which David St. Jacques had to appear and, and that got him off to the races. I mean, can, can you tell me about that? It was an incredibly talented group of Canadians, as you can imagine. It was very difficult selecting the final two, but uh, both candidates brought incredible charisma, incredible passion about space exploration, and done an amazing job in their Astronaut Canada training, and then throughout their career as astronauts so far. All right, ready? Okay, push. I pull. You mentioned the word charisma. And David St. Jacques, undeniably a strong communicator. How big of a factor was that when it came to choosing or deciding whether or not he ought to have that chance to, to blast off into outer space? It is really important. Communication is one of the fundamental skills that we look for in astronauts. It's important to be a scientist. It's important to be a team player. We also have to be able to communicate the reality of being in space, what it means to be in space, why it's so important for Canada to remain a major spacefaring nation, and then also what the Earth is really like looking at it from space. And what about the other sort of, I mean, everyday interactions? I mean, just, just meeting people and their, and their ability to, to have a conversation and to, to excite people. So from a selection perspective, we're interested in how the candidates interact with everyone, whether it's the receptionist at the hotel that they're staying at or the individual that they speak on the phone with at the Canadian Space Agency. From a committee perspective, we try and find out all this information. Wow, really? Yeah. The emphasis on communicating the goals of the space program. I wonder, does that, does that speak to what I think is one of the great challenges of the space program? And that is the bottom line. Right? I mean, space exploration, it, it ain't cheap. And, and it feels like you, you constantly have to, to convince people that it's worth the money. I mean, is that part of the thinking? That is part of the thinking, and we do have to be able to articulate why we're doing this. You know, if you look at the cost of space exploration, it's huge. However, the economic opportunity associated with space exploration is even larger. Right now, the global space program represents roughly a $350 billion industry, of which our share is roughly about five, five and a half billion dollars. Over the next 20 years, that will grow to in excess of one trillion dollars. So not only is space exploration about exploration, it's about innovation, it's about developing new technology. And so let me, let me put you on the spot a little bit. I mean, what, what is an example of something in particular with the mission, with the experiments that David St. Jacques might be running up on the International Space Station that you think holds enough promise that, that you know, us Earthlings should be excited about it? Yeah. What David's doing in space is evaluating a whole host of different experiments and things, but one of which is very, very exciting. It's virtual medical care. Wearing a specifically designed t-shirt that has physiologic sensors built into the t-shirt that record various bits of data from his body and can send that information down to mission control. Why is that important for healthcare on Earth? That's the future of healthcare on Earth. We're evolving from hospital-based, geographically-based healthcare into virtual clinical care, hospitals without walls, where we'll have elderly patients at home with an array of sensors either on their body, potentially inside their body, Body, that then take that information and send it wirelessly over the internet in a confidential manner so that it can be screened by clinicians to enable us to keep people at home and care for them in that environment. But I guess the question is, why do you have to do that in space? I mean, couldn't you test all these technologies down here? Oh, you can certainly test all the technologies down here. The requirements of space are what drive the development of these new technologies. It started in the 60s with critical care monitoring technology. That really didn't exist in hospitals until the Apollo program developed a requirement to record the heart rate of astronauts when they were out doing spacewalks. So all of a sudden the technology gets driven in space, applied on Earth, perfected on Earth, taken back to space, 
space and the continuity of the technology development cycle continues. If we zoom out a little bit and, and think of the, the bigger picture, there's all kinds of talk about a plan B for Earth uh, or a planet B uh, as, as the case may be, you know, thinking of Mars in particular. There are a number of, of, let's call them aspirational thinkers. I mean, think of Stephen Hawking, think of Elon Musk, who, who believe that the, the survival of our species, I mean, in, in the way that you know, space travel may be an escape hatch of sorts, that our survival depends on colonizing other worlds. Do you subscribe to that? I think that there's a strong argument to be made that that's an aspect of exploring space. I look at it fundamentally from a, an exploration perspective and hope that we're going to be able to protect our home planet and be able to thrive for millennia to come on our home planet. But we don't know. There could be some terrestrial imperative, some biological imperative that the human species has to leave Earth and go elsewhere in our solar system, in which case getting to Mars may take on a totally different significance. I wonder if, if there is an inherent danger in, in thinking of space exploration in that vein as being a way out in case we muck up this planet a little too much. Hey, there's always, there's always Mars. You know, I think it's important to think about what we're doing right now to the Earth and the impact that we, the human species, have had on our own planet. When we're in space, the greatest single message shared by every astronaut is the importance of taking care of our home planet. People would say, what planet do you want to live on in the solar system? I want to live on the Earth. It's the best planet in the solar system. And notwithstanding the fact that, sure, we can send humans to Mars and we'll do that in the next 50 to 100 years, but it's going to take a lot of technological change on the surface of Mars to enable us to live and thrive on that planet the same way we do on Earth. And, and there are other international aspirations beyond Mars, of course, right? I mean, we've, we've seen India with its grand plan to sort of breach the final frontier. We have China, which recently successfully made a, a touchdown on the far side of the moon. What do you think of all that? Are, are we seeing a new space race? I think we're seeing a new frontier that's opening up. There's absolutely no question. When you look at the economic forecast for the global space market, that growth is based on the continued and expanded exploration of space. I've written a series of kids' books. My fourth kids' book with Lord Anna talks about destination space, living on other planets in the solar system. Some reviewers said, no, no, that's science fiction. It's never going to happen. But to your point, I think it will happen. Over the course of the next 50 to 100 years of human space exploration, yes, we're going to see humans on Mars, we're going to see humans going farther into space. Is that exploration though largely cooperative or is it competitive? I think we're going to see whether that exploration will be cooperative or competitive. The greatest lesson of the International Space Station is the lesson of international collaboration and that we have countries from all over the world with individuals that speak totally different languages, developing technology in totally different ways, bringing it together successfully for the first time in space. That's a remarkable story of collaboration. And as we look to going back to the moon and ultimately on to Mars, the initial discussions are collaborative discussions, not necessarily competitive discussions. And yet you have the case of, of China, right? A global superpower that seems to be content on charting its own course, yes, doing its own thing. And in the beginning of the space program, that's the way it was as well. We had two major nations, the United States and Russia, exploring space on their own. And then they realized that there's an opportunity to come together in 1976 with the Apollo-Soyuz test project. So I think nations develop their own capability, and as they go forward and explore space, then they begin to recognize the opportunity to do it collaboratively and to leverage off each other's expertise. Let me ask you one last question. What is the great hope, so to speak, in terms of what, what fruit these forays into space might ultimately bear? I mean, is, is, it, is it wealth and, and resources? Is it the survival of our species? Is it, is it glory and, and inspiration? Or, or is it, you know, just another battlefield for, for humans to scrap it out on? You know, I think if we were to sum up the great hope of space exploration, we go to space in the hope that we can explore space, but more importantly, further understand ourselves and the world that we live in, and bring that planetary perspective of space back home to help us with fundamental issues here on Earth. And that's one of the greatest gifts that all astronauts experience when we're in space, is a desire to come back, share the experience with others, and help others develop a more planetary global perspective. Dave Williams, very nice to speak with you. Real pleasure, thanks.
<laughs> I learned a lot there. I, I learned for sure that I could never be an astronaut. I didn't have many <laughs> doubts about that. Well, why, why not? Why would you cut it? <laughs> not smart enough, claustrophobic, oh, <laughs> uh, probably not charming enough the way David St. Jacques is. But, but tell me this, what about the idea of just tourist space person? Like it, one day, can I just maybe take a vacation. Yeah, I think it's a super interesting idea. And, and you know, so I, I asked Dave Williams about that very notion. And it's really interesting to hear him talk about how it's not such a far-fetched idea, right? And, and not too distant into the future where he imagines there could be uh, people taking space vacations. So, you know, have a, having a, a space station orbit the Earth, but one that's built more for, for comfort and for luxury than for utility or, or scientific yeah. experiments, right? So, so it's like an ISS, but a, a space hotel. A cruise. So to speak. Yeah, it's like a cruise. A cruise. <laughs> <laughs> Mind blowing to think about. Intergalactic cruise. Yeah, no. It would be I a lot enjoyed of fun. that. I enjoyed that. <laughs> okay, ahead tonight on the National, a cross border show of support as the US government shutdown stretches on, a special delivery from Canada. One person said to me that they haven't felt this much camaraderie and seen this many people in the lunchroom um, since 9-11 when somebody else did the same thing. Welcome back. Here's a look at some of the stories we are tracking tonight, starting with a massive winter storm blanketing half the U.S. Let somebody else do that. You're going to get hurt. More than 30 centimeters of snow fell on the Midwest as the storm rolled east from Colorado towards the mid-Atlantic states. Seven people were killed in highway accidents, four of them in Missouri, three in Kansas. The storm also knocked out power today for nearly 200,000 people in Virginia and North Carolina. Also, air travelers were facing their own kind of havoc. Thousands of flights were either canceled or delayed, and a plane with more than 100 people on board slid off a runway in Kentucky. Now, no one was hurt, but winter storm warnings or advisories are in effect for millions of Americans in 10 states and Washington, D.C. The body of a woman has been recovered from the rubble of a Paris bakery, destroyed yesterday in a powerful explosion. That brings the number of dead to four. The blast injured dozens, some of them critically, but it appears to have been accidental. Firefighters were already on the scene investigating a suspected gas leak when it happened. Twelve neighboring buildings were also damaged, and they've been evacuated too. And a roof collapsed at a coal mine in northern China, killing 21 people. Another 66 were rescued, miners working underground at the time. The cause of the accident still under investigation, but deadly mining accidents are not unusual in China. The industry there has a poor safety record and hundreds are killed every year. The U.S. president is furious over bombshell allegations published in two prominent newspapers. They are reporting Donald Trump might have had compromising dealings with the Kremlin. And to make his point, the former reality TV star took a page from a game show. He phoned a friend. Paul Hunter has the details. For longer than he has been U.S. president, it's a question that's loomed over Donald Trump. What is his relationship with Russia and its president, Vladimir Putin? And joining me now by phone, the president of the United States. Last night on Fox News, Trump gave his answer yet again. I can tell you this. If you ask... The folks in Russia, I've been tougher on Russia than anybody else, any other, probably any other president, period. The interview came after two new reports this weekend. One of them in the New York Times said that back in 2017, the FBI was so suspicious of something nefarious between Trump and Russia that it began investigating whether Trump was in fact a threat to U.S. national security acting for Russia. So anchor Janine Pirro, a personal friend of Trump, asked... Are you now or have you ever worked for Russia, Mr. President? I think it's the most insulting thing I've ever been asked. I think it's the most insulting article I've ever had written. Uh, and if you read the article, you'd see that they found absolutely nothing. Then there's the other report in the Washington Post, looking back to that two-hour private meeting in Helsinki last year between Trump and Putin. Says the Post, afterward, Trump actively concealed details of the talks, even from those in his own administration. 
All of it, once again, leaves the U.S. wondering what in the world is going on with Trump and Russia. I'll certainly say this. Dismissing the Times report today, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. It's absolutely ludicrous. But Democrats call it more evidence special counsel Robert Mueller must be allowed to finish looking into everything, emphasizing the FBI rarely acts frivolously. They had to have a, a very deep level of concern about this president to take this step. And that's, again, why we need to protect the Mueller investigation. Trump again noted Mueller has yet to offer evidence of any wrongdoing by Trump himself, though, as others underline, the only person who knows all that Mueller has learned to date is Mueller himself. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Trump had some other things on his mind when he called Fox News, like, for instance, the government shutdown. And although he says he can, he doesn't want to declare a national emergency over the border wall. I'd rather see the Democrats come back from their vacation and act. They're not acting. And they're the ones that are holding it up. It would take me 15 minutes to get a deal done, and everybody could go back to work. But I'd like to see them act responsibly, and they're not acting responsibly. We have a, a very important thing to do. We have to have border security, and we have to get people uh, getting paid again very quickly. Meanwhile, 23 days on, and the U.S. aviation system is feeling the strain of the shutdown. Today, officials said a growing number of airport security screeners just failed to show up for work. Now, air traffic controllers in the U.S. are also going without pay right now. So their Canadian counterparts are sending some help. That's next in our moment of the day. The American air traffic controllers have written back in um, overwhelming gratitude, I guess is how I would summarize it, it's telling us thank you for improving the morale and the mood on what is a very, very dark situation for them. But first, Canadian musicians gathered tonight in Burlington, Ontario to pay tribute to Mike Taylor. If you're a fan, you might know him better as Beard Guy from Walk Off the Earth. He played keyboard and died in his sleep two weeks ago, leaving behind two children and a band that is reeling from the loss. Tonight is about coming together and expressing love and happiness. And we want to celebrate Mike for the incredible man that he was. So we really appreciate you all being here tonight to do that with us. And please don't hold back. If you want to cheer and you want to laugh and you want to share memories with friends beside you or you want to hold hands, or you want to shout and scream, please do. Please don't feel like you just need to stand in silence because that's not what our band is about, and you know that. So we're here tonight to celebrate. So I'm calling out. I'm calling out to find you. You gotta hold on to what you got, babe. It ain't always clean on the other side, you know. We ain't rich, but we worth a lot, babe. Wanna see the world with your hand in mine, you know. Come on, I love you like that. It ain't always greener on the other side, you know. Come on, I love you like that. Wanna see the world with your hand in mine, you know. As the U.S. government shutdown drags on, some federal employees, like air traffic controllers, are still on the job. They're just not being paid. Tough spot to be in. But the aviation community is apparently a tight one, and their Canadian counterparts wanted to show their support any way they could. Their simple act of kindness is our moment of the day. Some controllers in Edmonton decided to send pizzas to Anchorage, Alaska, and it has just literally gone viral. The controllers are literally going around saying, would you like to pitch in? Um, we're gonna buy pizzas for the, the US controllers. And some of the people ordering them got calls from the uh, visa fraud department um, because somebody ordered 50 pizzas to go to uh, New York City and that immediately triggered uh, credit card fraud and they got a call, did you really do this? Yeah, we did. There has been tremendous banter back and forth, um, camaraderie, a lot of joking about Canadian back bacon on the pizza, um, and don't send us ones with pineapple, um, et cetera. One person said to me that they haven't felt this much camaraderie and seen this many people in the lunchroom um, since 9-11 when somebody else did the same thing to buy um, food for the controllers in New York that were involved. It's really been a morale lifter, a big boost for the controllers. We're not getting our paycheck, but we know that there are people out there who appreciate what we do 
and, and coming from your peers who also do the same job, it's, it's been really great. It builds our relationship with them, but thank you is really what we wanted them to know is, is they're looking out for us and, and in turn, you know, we, we want to look out for them. Isn't there just something about free food at work that feels right? <laughs> I wouldn't know. <laughs> yeah. Every so often, some food appears in the newsroom, and it, I can say it, it, it feels great. So, um, you know, the backdrop is that a number of, of American air traffic controllers have missed their paycheck uh, this past Friday. Some are going to miss another paycheck on Tuesday. And it's worth mentioning that the Canadians, they, they did think about sending money to donate, but there's something like 13,000 American air traffic controllers, and so it just would have been impractical to, to send that much money uh, and distribute yeah. it. So, so they sent pizzas to, I think they're up to 41 different towers now. And if there's ever a job where you want people to be well-fed and, like, yeah. feeling calm, it's that yeah. job. Yeah, no, but we sure. are, you know, there's serious things going on here. This is the longest shutdown now in American history. And the, you know, there are reports that some people are having to, like, sell things on Craigslist just right. to get by. So um, pizzas will help for a while, but probably not in the long term. However, people can send us pizzas anytime. That would <laughs> Anytime. Be That's fine. Yeah, <laughs> fine. I'm fine with it. <laughs> That's the National for January the 13th. Good night, everybody. Good night.